Greetings. Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. I'm Salvador Cordova. And this video today was produced as part of a promise I made to Steve McRae of the Non Sequitur channel. First, before I go on, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to Steve McRae and his co host Victoria on that channel for having me on last week. Last week, we were talking about how to teach young earth creationism to children. And I, I think they were somewhat impressed when I said, well, it's only fair to teach them the problems with young earth creationism from a scientific standpoint. That would be the responsible thing to do. Even though I'm a young earth creationist, I will be the first to point out that there are severe problems from a mechanistic standpoint in the young earth model. Uh, if we'd solved all these problems, there wouldn't be need for researchers like me in this field. So that's the first thing. I mean, uh, you know, people will ask, well, why are you researching it if it's solved? And it's not. So I would definitely say to children that we haven't solved all the problems. That's the responsible thing to do, uh, rather than let them go off to university at some point and then be shocked uh, and be challenged. They have to be aware. Uh, they have to be forewarned of where there are problems in the model. And there are, there are problems. But then I think uh, uh, I also impressed them when I said, well, you know, it's also responsible to point out the major difficulties in evolutionary theory. And I wasn't talking about claims of universal common ancestry or geological timelines, uh, even though I personally think we can make a case against some of these. I said the real big problem, real big problem is the origin of complexity. And the way I expressed that was saying that there, the, all the major protein families follow an orchard. It looks like a creationist model of an orchard, meaning separate created architectures that suddenly emerged. And I would say they'd have to emerge as a matter of principle. And that caught his interest. And I said, well, this is going to be a long um, discussion why I believe that. And I said, I think I really shocked him when I said a lot of evolutionary biologists have agreed with me that uh, the major protein families form an orchard, not a universal tree where all proteins slash genes evolved from a single uh, gene ancestor. There had to be multiple uh, independent evolutionary events for these, how that could happen is kind of ambiguous, especially close to the origin of life. But even after that, you'd have all these taxonomically restricted genes, etc. And I'm going to try to illustrate the problem. And I'm going to try to illustrate some other problems with uh, the evolutionary model. But first, let me, let me bring up my slideshow here, see if I can get it. Up, okay. And so again, this was my presentation on uh, that there's no universal common ancestral protein or gene. And I'll also cover some other problems for evolution. First, a little bit about myself for those who don't know who I am. Uh, I was featured, my life story is told in uh, in the prestigious scientific journal Nature, I was in the cover story, April 28th, 27th, 2005. You can Google that. The title of the article is Intelligent Design Coming to Your Campus. And I was recently published. Uh, I published a, a chapter in the Handbook of the Mathematics of the Arts and Sciences, published by Springer Nature, which is a respectable scientific publisher. You could see there that the, the uh, price for the publication is almost $1,500. You can get it at Walmart. And I will tell you that I don't get a dime if you buy that book. So if you want to send me money, you can just send it to the PayPal account in the video description. Uh, the, the publisher gets this. Who can afford $1,500 books? Well, these are libraries, university libraries. So... Um, this work ended up in a university library. It was a collection of articles and essays 
uh, on mathematics and the arts and sciences. And our contribution was the chapter, uh, a 70 page chapter on dynamical systems and fitness maximization in evolutionary biology. I, my co-authors uh, are John Sanford, Bill Basner, and Ola Hoster, who's not pictured here. This is a little bit of the math that was showcased in our paper. It was critical of evolutionary biology. Uh, my my co-author, John Sanford, was also my boss for seven years, and I still work with him. I'm just no longer a paid employee, but I do have the privilege of trying to co-author, continue to co-author papers with him. He's a world-famous geneticist, genetic engineer. That's him with his uh, patented invention, the gene gun, uh, a process he owned the patent for, and which a, a sizable fraction of all the genetically improved organisms on the planet, particularly in our agriculture, were um, affected through, were created through his gene gun process. Uh, the picture below is Bill Basner, Emeritus Professor of Mathematics. Oh, by the way, uh, Dr. Sanford is uh, also a, is a retired Cornell research professor. Not pictured was my co-author, Ola Hoster, who's an award-winning mathematician in Sweden. He's a professor of population genetics, which is definitely related to evolutionary biology. And he had trained uh, anywhere from 14 to 18 PhD students uh, so far. Uh, Dr. Sanford was recently, uh, well, not too long ago, put it that way, about four years ago, uh, invited to speak at the NIH on genetic deterioration. And Bill Basner was also at a, at a um, he was the keynote speaker at a conference so all this to say, um, I, I have, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to work with uh, my distinguished colleagues who obviously were not ashamed uh, to have me as their co-author, even though I'm a creationist. How did we get away with putting a article that is critical of evolutionary biology in uh, a mainstream scientific uh, publication? We followed the strategy of just looking at what evolutionary biologists themselves have said about their own field. Uh, when we cited top-tier evolutionary biologists criticizing their own field, it was rather easy because it's, it, it, that would be considered mainstream. We did not cite any ID literature, intelligent design literature, nor creationist literature. We cited mainstream literature, but we elaborated on it, and uh, I think it was a successful publication. So I, I'll cover... Um, indirectly some of the sentiments of that paper, although not the substance. Uh, there's other papers I've written that um, elaborate on that, on, on, on some of the problems with evolutionary biology, and some of those papers are still in the works. So one of the things facing creationists, and I think Stephen Gould pointed this out, he said, did he, that is God, did he did God create to mimic evolution and test our faith thereby? So if we look at the diversity of life, it looks like it's organized like a family tree, much like you could see, um, much like you can see, uh, you can see, uh, you know, some people look more related than others. And definitely if you examine their genomes, you could, you can build a family tree and, by way of extension, when we see kind of the relatedness of organisms in terms of like, kind of like a tree-like hierarchical structure that looks very persuasive for universal common ancestry. But as I said, in today's talk, we'll assume that that's a given. Uh, I'm not gonna try to refute universal common ancestry today. It is the difficulty of evolving complexity. And to some extent, Darwin's origin of species by means of natural selection is, is slightly mistitled. I, I'd say the center focus of that work was chapter six, where it said, he said, organs of extreme perfection and complication. He was arguing that these organs like the eye of extreme perfection and complication could be evolved um, through a process of natural selection. And um, I think, that theory is beginning to fall apart, and I'm going to show some some of the reasons why. And it does also relate to the to the orchard model, which looks very much like a creationist model for the major protein families. 
But going back to this quote, let me try to explain um, how I see it. So, yes, it does look like it is evolved, but th th there are things in in uh, the physics world where something is not like what it seems superficially. I would say evolutionary biology is akin to this appearance of a bent pencil. The pencil is not actually bent. Uh, it's an optical illusion. In fact, it is straight, but uh, sometimes our perception is distorted if we don't have all the facts. The more facts we gather, we're able to figure out why something looks the way it does when it really isn't. Um, in the case of the bent pencil, it was solved by uh, uh, someone named Snell, uh, after which we named, um, named a law after him called Snell's Law that, explained that explains this. And also another ex classic example in physics is geocentrism. We see the sun rise and set every day. And so it was reasonable to think that the sun orbited the earth, but it took a lot of study and the examination of anomalies that overturned the geocentric model, that is where the earth is at the center of the universe, in favor of the heliocentric model, where the sun is in the uh, kind of the center of the solar system. And, and, and you know, I, I had to say kind of like, because uh, we actually have, we have these elliptical orbits. So I'll, I'll grant that, you know, we do have the perception of uh, evolution, but there are enough anomalies to make us question how, how naturally this can happen. So I'll begin by talking about the protein orchard. So we have this, uh, I'll, I'll specifically talk about two pro, uh, a few proteins to help introduce the topic. So this is, uh, this is collagen. This is a picture of collagen. You can buy collagen at the store as a beauty product, but it's actually um, part of a protein that we express, we humans express about a th anywhere from 25% to 30% of our protein weight are collagens. Collagen, like all other proteins, are composed of amino acids. There are amino acids, uh, 20 canonical ones, and they can be represented by English alphabetical letters. And so we can actually represent the sequence of a protein with English alphabetical letters like this. This is uh, the spelling of the collagen type one, alpha one paralog, about uh, 1,464 amino acids long. And I'm gonna zoom it in a little bit so it's a little clearer. So let's just look at this for a little bit. Do you see a pattern here? There's a non-random pattern here, and I'm going to highlight it. Uh, collagen is one of the few proteins you can actually see the pattern visually. And there it is. Uh, I highlight, specifically highlighted the G amino acids, the glycines. You can see this is a non-random pattern. It's a violation of the law of large numbers. You wouldn't expect a random pattern to look like this. Now, not all proteins you could see patterns this easily. This is a very exceptional case but it's a good way to illustrate the, the problem of protein orchards. So I can, I can say that we have this some sort of motif that's very strongly uh, in the collagen where you have a glycine followed by some amino acids of uh, 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 you know, uh, not any fixed spelling, and then another glycine every, every third position. Now I'm gonna show the human zinc finger, human crab zinc finger 136. And again, it's spelled. And oh, I'd say it has, yeah, it has 540 amino acids. So it's about a, a third smaller than the collagen. And I'm expanding it just so you could see it. Can you see a pattern there? Let me show it. There, that, those, the uh, C's there are, uh, are, you could see how they nicely align throughout the protein. And same for the H's, the C's are cysteines, the H are histidines. That's very important for this protein to be able to connect 
to bind to a zinc ion, and that's very critical to its function. Each of the, you could, if, you, if you looked at this and said, oh, they're, they're rows, let's see, try to highlight this. Each of these is a row, and it's an individual zinc finger, and so there would be zinc ions connected to each of these rows uh, when the protein is properly folded. And there are other, there are other uh, deeper patterns there. If we use this Venn diagram coloring to uh, even group some of the amino acids into their Venn diagram groups, I'm going to do that. You'll see even deeper patterns there. So there, be, there can be uh, variability in between uh, those uh, colored columns, uh, but the colored columns have to be uh, definitely the, the cysteine and histidine, that is the red and the purple, have to be there. Otherwise, it's not going to function. They have to be there. So there is some variability, but then there are, there are some, um, some non-negotiable amino acids, and those are important. So we could say then that the, uh, the, uh, this zinc finger, it's a classical, what they call a C2H2 zinc finger. There's kind of a, mo a motif in each of those rows, and it's something like that. So what am I getting to with all this? You could see that uh, it's difficult to evolve a collagen into a zinc finger or vice versa. And by way of extension, it's going to be difficult to hypothesize a universal common ancestor that resembles both uh, um, without, you know, making incredible stretches of imagination, because you could see they're very, very different. And mechanically speaking, this is also the case. If we started to, like, try to modify the collagen on the left to, to make it look more like a zinc finger, it's... it's <laughs> it's going to compromise its function. It's, it's going to cease being a collagen and vice versa. If you tried to modify the zinc finger to be a collagen, it's going to break down as a zinc finger. So there's all this specialization and it's not really sensible to argue for a universal common ancestor, even, um, you know, except one where there, uh, it might've been there, but then there were all these radical transformations simultaneously that made a functional either collagen or zinc finger. Some will argue that, you know, maybe it wasn't quite as specialized and then it evolved. That's pure speculation and nothing we know about protein, uh, proteins would support that uh, one bit. I'll also say evolutionary biologists actually uh, that I've talked to acknowledge this because when they put proteins like this in, a, in, in an alignment algorithm or some, where they put a whole bunch of proteins in some sort of um, program that's supposed to detect trees, it doesn't find them. You can use these hidden Markov models or whatever, and it just won't find any homology. And therefore, we, uh, uh, it would re they would reject common ancestry of this for the same reasons that I do. Common ancestry in the sense that there's not any gradual progression. So what we have then, what I'm trying to, maybe I can try to illustrate that. We have the architecture of a piano, we have the architecture of cars. We have the architecture of helicopters. And within each architecture, you can, you can make variations as long as you remain faithful to, to the basic architectural uh, features and its function. But um, so at a conceptual level, you can imagine making changes to a, uh, an existing car and maybe modifying it to be a slightly different car. But you're not, it doesn't make sense to try to make an intermediate between a piano and a car. So, uh, uh, this would sort of parallel the issues about micro and macro evolution. I'm not going to go there. I hope the pictures are strong enough to kind of convey the essential point. And that is, it's very hard to evolve uh, these from a common ancestor or from uh, one major form to another. However, you can have variation within the same architecture. So, for example, even though the human zinc finger, 136, is only 50 to 60% similar to the uh, pig zinc finger, 136, it still has the same basic architectural features like that, but there is variation 
in uh, the spelling uh, except for the non-negotiable parts. So I hope that's clear. And we can, as evolutionists like to do, build these phylogenetic trees across species, and, and they will make they will use this to make an argument for common ancestry. As I said, for the purposes of today, I will accept it, uh, common ancestry. But the, the issue is how did these other architectures emerge? And so uh, let's look at the collagen. We can do the same with the collagen. Uh, on the left is the human version of this collagen. On the right is the zebrafish. And it's about 75% similar based, uh, depending on what scoring method you use. You'll get a different score depending if you di use different scoring methods. But you could see uh, architecturally they're deeply similar. And I'll say, yeah, that's, that's fine. Uh, for the purposes of, purposes of today, we'll say, let's accept universal common ancestry. Uh, and. and Again, I would say this is somewhat like geocentrism or the bent pencil. There could be another explanation than common ancestry, and the reason for that, uh, or if we accept common ancestry, I would say you'd need statistical miracles. And this illustrates kind of the problem right here. Uh, uh, there's not a gradual transition from one to, to the other. There definitely... Uh, it's not a matter of fossil missing links. It is uh, missing links in principle. So now the creationists would like to have uh, the diagram on the right for species, the, the orchard model, where they're independent created kinds versus the universal tree. But what I tried to show is like, let, let's do something a little bit more modest. We could say that there is kind of more of an... Um, uh, an orchard, as in, on the right side of this diagram, uh, independent origin of major protein families, of major protein families. Uh, I don't think the creation, you know, uh, to do this at the organismal level is going to be a lot more challenging, but I think it's really clear, really clear with the protein slash gene families. Now, I, I'm going to introduce uh, another protein. Uh, I had published on this done research on this, on the post-translational modifications of the topoisomerase 2-alpha enzyme, and I'm going to show a video of that. I had the privilege of being a co-author with lead author Joe DeWeese, who's also a young earth creationist, and Joe DeWeese, even though he's a young earth creationist, he was published, he published a paper in topoisomerase in the prestigious scientific journal Nature. So there is an, there is opportunity for creationists to work in biological fields and still um, reject evolutionary theory. And Joe DeWeese is one example uh, because there's a lot of need for researchers in this field uh, because topoisomerase is uh, an important is an important um, enzyme in the study of cures or treatments uh, treatments for cancer. Let me take down the slideshow. So. When we have chemotherapies, uh, the chemotherapies disrupt the operation of topoisomerase, and then the cell dies. So, uh, unfortunately, chemotherapies also, you know, the idea is to kill the cancer cells. Unfortunately, it kills a lot of healthy cells too. But the point is, topoisomerase is a very essential, um, essential protein, essential enzyme for the functioning of life, and that will play uh, into another argument I'm about to make. But first, let's watch the topoisomerase video. Let's consider what happens as DNA unwinds during replication. As DNA unwinds, it acts like this rope when we pull apart its two strands. As you pull the strands apart, twisting tension builds up in the rest of the coiled portion. It is actually adding one twist to the remaining rope for each twist pulled out of it. At some point, you can't separate the strands anymore. The remaining rope is too tightly twisted. If you relax your tension on the rope, it will twist around itself in a supercoil. It is releasing tension. If you want to keep pulling the rope apart, you have to release the tension periodically, and one way to do this is to cut the rope and splice it back together. This problem has been best characterized in small circular DNAs. 
there are two methods of dealing with this problem in DNA. One cuts only one strand of the DNA double helix, and the other cuts both strands. Let's look at the first. Topoisomerase 1 enzymes cut a single strand of the double helix, pass the other strand through the cut, and reseal the break, relaxing the overwound molecule, which now has one fewer twist. Topoisomerase 2 enzymes do the same thing but with both strands of the double helix. Topoisomerase 2 cuts both strands of a double-stranded DNA and passes another double strand through the break and then reseals the break. So if a molecule of DNA is supercoiled, topoisomerase 2 can remove the supercoiling, two twists at a time, to yield a relaxed circle. I hope that that video was enlightening. There's some things to consider uh, then why it's hard to evolve this, specifically this protein. So there are genes that humans are able to live without. Uh, they could be disabled or otherwise compromised and were able to, to at least survive. The problem with proteins like topoisomerase is if they don't exist, uh, you're probably dead. If they don't exist in your genome, you're probably dead. And again, I said, uh, evidence of this would be the fact that chemotherapy specifically target the action of topoisomerase to disrupt it. So when I put forward claims that it, it's just uh, it's statistically improbable, it would be metaphorically, metaphorically like um, um, uh, expecting a tornado passing through a junkyard to create a 747. It's metaphorically similar to trying to evolve a topoisomerase. Evolutionary biologists will come back and say, well, you're not considering natural selection. But the problem is, for things like topoisomerase, if all the pieces are not there, there's going to be some challenges. Let me point them out. If, for example, you had a topoisomerase or a proto-topoisomerase, and it's evolving, and the first thing it evolves is to be able to cut the DNA. If there's not any means uh, to stitch it back together, this is really bad. It could be another protein or something, but there has to be a means to stitch it back together and also entangle it. So if you just have a cutter, if all you've evolved is a cutter without any means of controlling when and how it cuts and then reconnecting it and, you know, before reconnecting it, untangling it, it's, it's either lethal or at best useless. Same for a topoisomerase that can untangle but can't uh, cut or a topoisomerase that can reconnect, but it doesn't cut to begin with. And then we could talk about not being able to locate it in the right spot and deploy it at the right time. And there's some interesting, I think, still outstanding problems in how the topoisomerase is able to first sense those tangles and then, quote unquote, decide to take action. Uh, how that's done, I don't think is well characterized. But there are enough things that we know that it, 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 it's very evident, I think, to say that natural selection is not going to evolve this in gradual steps. I've seen some peer-reviewed articles that say, well, topoisomerase evolved in multiple independent lineages and not from a common ancestor. And they can assert that, but it's like, well, how did the organism survive without it before it evolved? And that's a legitimate question. And so, so what some people say, well, that's an origin of life question. Well, uh, there's some aspects of topoisomerase, which I'm going to show, that also make it relevant to the evolution of uh, eukaryotic cells. So let me uh, bring up my screen here. And so I'm going to first show the spelling of the topoisomerase enzyme. Uh, that's the spelling there. And I have some coloring uh, of the regions to, to highlight kind of the really important functional regions. Uh, th those, uh, the, uh, but suffice to say, on the left is the spelling. On the right is the topoisomerase uh, complex, a, a home, what they call a homodimer. When the gene of topoisomerase 2-alpha is expressed, it actually has to make two copies. Uh, 
quote unquote, the red copy and then the blue copy, the, the copies come together like a pair of scissors, and then you have a functioning to apply isomerase. So for the two parts to connect, it needs to have connection points and the colored uh, letters there are the estimated connection points. I did a study on this uh, using an automated tool to estimate the connection points. And you can see that it's not trivial to build a topoisomerase. And you're definitely not, definitely not going to evolve a topoisomerase into a collagen or a zinc finger protein. Um, and there are some other layers of organization I could highlight there in terms of the alpha helix, helices, beta strands, and turns. We'll just skip that. Uh, and then we have regions of post-translational modifications, which is the area that I published on. And here's some illustrations of the uh, post-translational modifications. But, sorry for all the technical terms, but this is the diagram I want to focus on. So this is still the same spelling of that topoisomerase 2 alpha in humans. I want to highlight in particular, see if I could do this. Hopefully you could see my little laser pointer. See this region here in, in red? It's called the bipartite nuclear localization signal. So you can see I have a legend here and this one's the bipartite nuclear localization signal. And why is this important? And why can this kind of slip through kind of the evolutionary phylogenetic methods? Well, if we take the topoisomerase across species, and you can see all the different species here, human, chimp, dogs, rats, etc., yeast, and then finally the bacteria, uh, everything except... Um, the bacteria are eukaryotes, and the bacteria is obviously a prokaryote here. You can do an alignment, and then you can build these phylogenetic trees. This is one phylogenetic tree I built. The phylogenetic tree is just kind of like a common ancestry tree. And so you would group like the human and chimp, who are more similar, uh, kind of closer together. And, and you would make the human very, very uh, far away. Uh, uh, from the E. coli in this diagram to reflect the fact that their, their, their topoisomerases are spelled very, very differently, but there's passing similarity. One way you could see the similarity, and I did this alignment in a software called Mega, you could see here that there are some amino acids that are similar, that are identical uh, at the same, uh, roughly the same position here. And that's what I call kind of the non-negotiable points of the topoisomerase. And you can see there's a lot of variability in between. Why am I pointing this out? It's easy for evolutionary software and analysis that will build trees like this to, to say, oh, well, they're, you know, they're similar enough that they're related, but then we'll have problems, you know, you'll have this section and they'll say, okay, well, well that's just variability. But I want to point out this, this nuclear localization signal is really, really important. I would argue that uh, you'd be dead if you didn't have that localization signal. And a localization signal is like a password. Local, a localization signal is like a password. If you don't have all the letters right, uh, you don't get logged in. Now, with Localization signals, there's a little bit of fluff. You don't need exactly all the letters, but you got to have a lot of them right. There is a Wikipedia entry, several that talk about nuclear localization and also target peptides. There are all these codes. And let me reshare my screen. There are all these codes in biology. Let me reshare my screen. Thank you for your forbearance here. There are all these codes in biology on the proteins themselves are like passwords. They have to be strategically, strategically located on the protein to enable them to uh, uh, locate in the cell. So, for example, especially in the eukaryotic cell, you have all these little compartments and organelles. Like you have the, uh, in a plant, you'd have the chloroplasts. Uh, you pretty much always have mitochondrion. Uh, there's an endoplasmic reticulum. And then you have this nucleus. That is a very distinguishing 
characteristic of a eukaryotic cell architecture. So in the nucleus, you have the DNA, and then the DNA will come out here, and then it will get, uh, it'll use the DNA, the, the uh, ribosomes around here will uh, use the DNA. Well, actually, the DNA will make an RNA. <laughs> uh, forgive me, I misspoke. The DNA will make RNAs, mRNAs, mature RNAs. They'll come out here. The mRNA will then be translated, will be used as a blueprint to make proteins that will follow that uh, RNA blueprint. And then the protein has to go back inside if it has a lo nuclear localization signal. Now, it may have other signals that will put it anywhere else in the cell, and that's what I call the targeting peptides. But if the targeting peptide is a nuclear localization signal, it goes back into the nucleus to be able to, to perform its task. So the topoisomerase, the, uh, the gene for the topoisomerase will start here. Uh, the, um, there'll be a transcription process, and the gene will have an, a corresponding mRNA that gets exported out. It has to find a location here, find a ribosome that will use the RNA as a template to make the topoisomerase protein. And the the topoisomerase protein then goes back into the nucleus. But it can only go back if its nuclear localization code is in the right place and it's spelled right. That's a requirement. And I'll also point out, for the evolution of eukaryotes, this would have to be true for everything, uh, all the proteins that have to go back into the nucleus. They need to have their nuclear localization signals there too. And for critical proteins, if they don't have that localization signal, the cell is dead. Hence, it's not going to evolve. If it's dead, it's, uh, it's a dead end at that point. And I have... Uh, confronted evolutionary biologists over this, and they said, yes, you, you do, you know, they say, Sal, you did point out some complexity. I'm just not, I'm just not ready to go and invoke the supernatural as an explanation. And I said, I, I totally respect that, but I did appreciate them uh, acknowledging that we needed a, we needed to reformat all the critical proteins in the evolution of prokaryote to eukaryote. And I think even though they might not concede this, I would have to say those transformations have to be simultaneous on massive scale. Uh, in addition to, and we could go, there's like a two hour show where I could go into the complexity. But just to give you a taste of this complexity, let me show this video now of the nuclear import export process, which will involve the topoisomerase and the localization signals. Now the localization signal they show here is kind of short, but I showed you just how long it is in the topoisomerase protein. So uh, this is only gonna be like four or five minutes long. So sit back and enjoy. The nuclear pore complexes are the only channels through which small polar molecules, ions, and macromolecules can travel between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. By controlling this traffic, the nuclear pore complex plays a fundamental role in the physiology of all eukaryotic cells. Most proteins and RNAs are too large to move through the complex by passive diffusion and must move by an active process in which appropriate proteins and RNAs are recognized and selectively transported in a specific direction. Let's consider proteins imported from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. Only a subset of proteins can enter the nucleus and they are allowed in by virtue of having specific amino acid sequences called nuclear localization signals. Nuclear localization signals typically consist of one or two short segments of basic amino acids. Nuclear localization signals are recognized by nuclear transport receptors called importins, which carry the cargo proteins into the nucleus. With its cargo attached, important binds to specific nuclear pore proteins in the cytoplasmic filaments. By sequential binding to more interior nuclear pore proteins, the complex is translocated through the nuclear pore. At the nuclear side of the pore, the complex is disrupted by the binding of a protein called RAN to important. RAN carries a molecule of GTP. This binding changes the conformation of important which then releases its cargo protein into the nucleus. 
The important RAN complex is then re-exported through the nuclear pore. A protein in the cytoplasm called RAN gap for GTPase activating protein stimulates RAN to hydrolyze its GTP to GDP, an action that triggers RAN to release important back into the cytoplasm. RAN plays a key role in protein import and export. Note that while RAN is bound to GDP, it cannot disrupt the binding of important to a cargo protein. In an action that prevents the depletion of RAN from the nucleus, the RAN GDP formed in the cytoplasm is transported back to the nucleus by its own import receptor, a protein called NTF2. In the nucleus, another protein called RAN-GEF for guanine nucleotide exchange factor stimulates RAN-GDP to release its GDP and pick up GTP. In this form, RAN-GTP can disrupt the binding of important and its cargo, triggering the release of the cargo in the nucleus. By the actions of RAN-GEF, found only in the nucleus, and RAN-GAP, found only in the cytoplasm, a steep gradient of RAN-GTP and RAN-GDP is maintained across the nuclear membrane, with RAN-GTP inside the nucleus and RAN-GDP in the cytoplasm. Similar to imported proteins, proteins are targeted for export from the nucleus by specific amino acid sequences called nuclear export signals. Nuclear export signals are recognized by receptors within the nucleus called exportins, which direct protein transport through the nuclear pore complex to the cytoplasm. RAN-GTP promotes the formation of stable complexes between exportins and their cargo proteins. Note that this same form of RAN does the opposite for importins and their cargos. The effect of RAN-GTP binding on exportins dictates the movement of proteins containing nuclear export signals from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. Following transport to the cytosolic side of the nuclear envelope, GTP hydrolysis and release of RAN-GDP leads to dissociation of the cargo protein, which is released into the cytoplasm. Exportins are then recycled through the nuclear pore complex for reuse. So you could see uh, how complex, first of all, the cell is. I hope if for nothing else, you've seen a level of complexity that you probably were not aware of. Uh, I would argue that level of complexity is just uh, for, too hard to evolve. Maybe that's not where you are, but that's certainly where I'm at. I've not, the longer I've studied biology, the more that I see this, and it just becomes too difficult for me to um, believe it could happen naturally. Some people will say that's argument from incredulity. I'd say it's argument by contradiction, much like we would not expect a tornado passing through a junkyard to create a 747. I think all that we know of, um, that we, uh, all of our accepted laws of physics and chemistry and our understanding of cellular biology, molecular biology, protein biology, et cetera, it's not consistent that this uh, should spontaneously happen even over millions of years. And uh, people could, of course, invoke uh, other yet to be discovered laws of physics. Uh, some people do that, uh, but one has to accept that on faith. Same for in invoking multiverses or any other exotic mechanism. So, so that's one of the reasons I think evolutionary theory, as far as the evolution of complexity, is still deeply problematic. So let me go back to my slideshow, and I'd, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, my colleague, Change Tan. She's a professor at a secular university in molecular biology. Some of, her, some of the inspiration for this talk is through her. She also wrote a uh, great critique of uh, abiogenesis with her co-author, Rob Stadler. Both of them are Harvard-trained. She was a Harvard postdoc. Her co-author, Rob Stadler, is a Harvard MIT trained scientist. And so going back to what I think of evolutionary theory, I think that on some level, it's like this bent pencil. It will, uh, if we look at it superficially, we could think that we could think evolutionary theory is 
the correct explanation, much like we could look at this superficially and think the pencil is bent when it's actually not. And uh, examination, more careful examination of the facts will tell us it's actually straight, that um, our first impressions are misleading us. And um, I'd say the same for uh, geocentrism. So what is the, what is my reason for why, uh, what's the reason that there's similarity in organisms if it's not evolved? And this is just, at this point, a metaphysical thought. I think that um, the patterns of similarity and diversity are there to provide a stairway or stairways to understanding. We can understand human biology because of the similarity, patterns of similarity and diversity in, in organisms. And um, so here's another picture of comp more complex stairways. We can, other, we can understand other organisms by studying, we can understand some organisms by actually studying a variety of other organisms. So it's a beautiful way to kind of put together the puzzle of how biology actually operates from a mechanistic standpoint. And um, uh, for example, there are lots of genes that we share supposedly, and um, there's been some argument over this diagram here that we might share with say a uh, chicken that we don't share with mice. And there might be things we share with the, um, a mouse that we don't share with a chicken and there are other creatures there. Uh, this is, I think, what they call a pan-genome diagram. And one thing we do know is the way we do go about medical science is to study what we call model organisms. So if we want to study the nervous system, we'll study things like uh, roundworms and squids. Uh, if we want to study the uh, chromatin, Inside humans, we'll study yeast. Uh, if we want to study the transcription translation system, the genetic code, we study bacteria. And if we really want good model organisms to uh, study the effectiveness of pharmaceuticals, we have mice and chimps. The alternative to not having creatures similar to us is we would have to dissect each other including human fetuses to study embryology. But uh, thankfully we have model organisms like uh, this uh, fetal pig and other creatures. So I would say that's my explanation to the, um, to the problem of the bent pencil, that um, it's all there as part of a, a means of helping us understand our own biology by st studying uh, other creatures. So uh, notwithstanding that what I just put forward is a speculation, uh, I'm motivated in part toward that because of the, the complications that I've laid out here. And, and I've only touched the tip of the iceberg. So Steve, if you're listening, I really want to thank you for your interest in this. Um, you had said that you'd be willing to have me on your show to talk about this, either the non sequitur show or your own channel. That's very generous of you. And I will say, uh, I definitely would accept if it would be just working out the logistics of me appearing. And I thank you for giving me an opportunity to uh, have your audience. I would also thank the viewers of this channel, uh, both live and in recording for, for joining this talk today. Take care, God bless you and have a great day.